I'll let you know when it's actually started. Okay. And we're live. Welcome um, to Goldsmith's Degree Show for Creative Writing. I'm Malene shepherd scavitt co-convener for Creative Writing, and I'm joined by my fellow convener, Philip Palmer, to welcome the Creative Writing Class of 2021 for Media Communication and Cultural Studies and Media and English. This has been an unprecedented year, and the students have gone through such hardship to get here today. As everyone in the UK knows, we've been more or less in repeated lockdowns since March 2020. For most of this academic year, the students were attending all their classes on Teams, many of them from somewhere other than London. Many who were here have not seen their families or been home for a year and a half. We only came back to campus for a month, which was wonderful, and the student did a bit of controlled socializing, but the fact is, the graduates are finishing their year without classes on campus, parties, normal hanging out, being young, being students, everything it means to be in college. What is more amazing is that they have not complained. They have asked for and hoped for more, but overall, they have been extraordinarily kind and encouraging to each other, making the very best of this terribly difficult situation. These students have worked so hard under immense pressure and difficulties. Amazingly, they've still managed to learn, to grow and to produce wonderful and inspiring work. We are so proud of you. You are an inspiration. Tonight, we will hear readings of their work and we are pleased to be joined by members of the Goldsmith Theater and Performance Department, actors, Louis Pickles, Irene Savriachi and TJ Broderick. We have an exciting program of script, prose, poetry, and a song. And thank you to Alexa Golimi and um, Joel D'Agostino and Lewis Pickles for organizing the evening. I want to just give a quick disclaimer. This is a reading, not a performance. Therefore, the actors do not necessarily represent the cultural background, race, age, and sexuality of the characters they play. We will start with a children's book by Alexa Beatrice Jolielmi, um, The Crash Landing Alien Who Ate All Our Food, and it will be read by Peter Shepard Skevitt. The crash landing alien who ate all our food. One dark evening, Jocelyn and her sister Christina were star spotting in their backyard. Look, said Jocelyn, it's the first star. But the star grew closer and closer and closer until BAM! Something landed in their backyard. It was a spaceship. Its doors opened and out rolled a glowing green ball. A little antenna sprang out from the top and the ball made a funny little sound. Whee! Oh my gosh, said Jocelyn. It's an alien, said Christina. Dad called the girls from the kitchen. Christina, Jocelyn, what's happening out there? It's time for dinner. Kai Natayo. Dad, Dad. They said, running into their house. The little alien bounced behind them. An alien crash landed in our backyard. An alien? said that. What's its name? Christina and Jocelyn frowned. Suddenly, Jocelyn had a brilliant idea. We'll call it 
De Johan. It means alien in Tagalog, right, Dad? Correct, Jocelyn. What a lovely name. De Johan, would you like to join us for dinner? The alien jumped and spun and took a seat by the table. <coughs> said De Johan. There was panchit bihon, chicken adobo, fried tilapia, lumpia. I hope you're hungry, said Dad. But as they all sat down, Dayun jumped up and ate all their food. Slurp, slurp, it ate the panchit bihon. Munch, munch, it ate the chicken adobo. Crunch, crunch, chomp, chomp, it ate the fried tilapia and the lumpia. And finally, bruh, all their food was gone. Oh no, cried Jocelyn, Christina and Dad. Dayuhan's stomach grumbled. And it's still hungry, said Christina. Why don't you bring Dayuhan to our neighbours? It can try their food, said Dad. So Christina, Jocelyn and Dayuhan went out of the kitchen, out of their house and into their neighbour Lorenzo's home. Their table was filled with food. There was insalata caprese, arancini, prosciutto e melone, spaghetti al pomodoro. Slurp, slurp, it ate the spaghetti al pomodoro. Munch, munch, it ate the arancini. Crunch, crunch, chomp, chomp, it ate the prosciutto e melone and the insalata caprese. And finally, burp. Dayuhan's stomach grumbled again. Oh no, cried Jocelyn and Christina. It's still hungry. I have an idea, said Lorenzo. We can go to Tao's house. He lives next door. So Christina, Jocelyn, Lorenzo and Dayohan went out of the kitchen, out of the house and into Tao's home. On their table was a feast. There was banh mi, goi kron, kom tam, ban xiao. Slurp, slurp, it ate the goi kron. Munch, munch, it ate the banh mi. Crunch, crunch, chomp, chomp, it ate the banjo and the kom tam, and finally, burp. Dayohan's stomach grumbled again. Oh no, cried Jocelyn, Christina, and Lorenzo. It's still hungry. I have an idea, said Thal. We can go to Esme's house. She lives next door. So Christina, Jocelyn, Lorenzo, Tao, and Dayohan went out the kitchen, out of the house, and into Esme's home. On the table was a single, gooey, giant, sticky toffee cake. Esme cut a slice for everyone, and munch, chomp, yum, everyone got to eat. Dayohan ate his slice in one big bite. Woo! said Deohan. The alien wobbled and jiggled and turned into a rainbow of colours. Jocelyn, Christina, Lorenzo, Tao and Esme all laughed until Deohan was normal again. Burp! Deohan's stomach did not grumble again. It's full, said Jocelyn. All it needed was to eat something sweet. After the cake, it was time to go home. Thank you for feeding our alien, said Jocelyn and Christina. They left with Deohan, out of the dining room, out of the house, and finally back into their own home. Dad came out of the kitchen carrying a steaming plate of bistec and sinangang. Dad took out four plates, but Deohan burped. It didn't want to eat. Finally, said Christina, we can eat our own food. Slurp, munch, crunch, chomp, went Jocelyn, Christina, and Dad. When they were done, Deohan bounced off the table out of the kitchen and into their backyard. Jocelyn, Christina and Dad followed it outside. Dayohan went to its spaceship and opened its mouth. The ship wobbled and jiggled and turned into a rainbow of colours. It stopped and began floating in the midair. I think Dayohan is going home now, said Dad. Girls, say goodbye to our new friend. Jocelyn and Christina hugged Dayohan. The alien waved goodbye with its antenna and hopped inside its ship. Bye, Deohan, come back soon, said the girls. We'll have dessert ready for you next time. Together, they watched their new friend join the stars in the sky. The end. And, and that was Alexia, Beatrice, Golemis, the crash-landing alien who ate all our food, read by 
Peter Shepard Scabbard. Next, we will hear the beginning of Martha Harris' short story, In All the Things I've Grown, read by Elise Harbert. Olive, Olive is supposed to be having the time of her life, but everything is falling apart. She's left to pick up the pieces, addressing challenging family issues in order to discover what really matters. It wasn't the first time I'd been left alone, surrounded by Saturday morning grease and half-eaten poached eggs. Squeaky cockery and conversations turned up to ten. I picked up my nails under the table, my hand yo-yoing back and forth to check my phone. He was late again. I stared into the pot of cheap cutlery that that sat untouched in the middle of the table. It was the type of cutlery that you could bend with your hands. How many mouths had those forks seen inside, I wondered. I could just make about my dull reflection in the convex side of a spoon, all hair with a slither of face coming through between the blonde, very still, waiting, not so patiently anymore. It was coming up to my 34th minute sat in the cafe and I was getting tired of the gaudy polka dot tablecloths and overly attentive waiters who seemed determined to either bring me food or take away my table. My brother was always late, but rarely more than 20 minutes. I called him again, voicemail. No one uses voicemail these days, but fuck it. I could express my anger after the tone, where it'd probably never be heard. Jared, it's Olive. Where are you? I hissed, covering my mouth with, with a casual hand so as not to distract the happy toast crunchers. I've been waiting for fucking ages and I'm going to have to leave soon. I'm sorry, I don't know what to do. You're probably hungover or whatever, but if you didn't want to spend your birthday morning with me, you could have let me know before I came all the way from fucking London. Sharp April air felt like a blessing as the door dinged behind me and I stepped out into the shadowy side of the street. Sun was beating bright and harsh on the opposite pavement and I crossed to feel it. Regretting bringing my coat, I started in the direction of Jared's house. If he couldn't come to me, I'd have to go to him. I made my way through town, bag hanging heavy with the birthday booze for my brother. Brighton was always busy on Saturdays and on a hot spring day in the city was guaranteed to buzz. A mix sorted at all angles. Small children dragging on tired parents' arms and grey faces walking part, walking grey pavements on their return from the night before. Premature shorts exposed pale skin that soaked up the, soaked up the first of the year's rays and people walked eagerly in the direction of the beach. A homeless woman sat in the path throwing a brand new squeaky toy for her staffy, her weathered face full of love. Pre-teens walked past her with tiny shopping bags from H&M and Claire's accessories, giving her their change when she asked because they didn't know how to say no. A distinct blend of fried breakfast and lush cosmetics was clammy in the air. I'd missed this place. It felt like a part of me, embedded in my genes and in my deepest sense of self. The warmth of it came with an unavoidable sting of memories. Jared and I had spent our whole childhood here and it was probably the best and the worst times of our lives. Dad sold the home a couple of years ago now. It felt huge to me as a child, but it was actually quite a small place for a family for. Our neighbourhood was built of row after row of close-knit terraced houses, all different colours. Mum knew everyone nearby, and we'd always be going to playdates with neighbours and friends. Dad was usually working, often spending days at a time in London, earning money so Mum could make her children her job. She would always be back on Fridays, though and take little Gerard and I, quivering with excitement, down to the fish and chip shop. We got to know the owner and he would present us with a shiny yellow chip to eat while we waited. One for me, one for Jared. They'd always be too hot and we'd sit in the corner blowing on them until Dad came over with our dinner. If we were lucky, we might down to the coast to Rottingdean or Ovingdean and join the milky white cliffs facing the ocean. In the summer, we took our bikes or scooters and Dad would race us down the paths on foot. Mum came occasionally, but she liked her Friday nights off. She usually out, go out to see a friend or sometimes we find her curled up on the sofa with a glass of wine. But on the night she was home, she'd jump up to greet us at the door, arms open wide like wings. In winter, I would lie in bed with my palms together, composing long, elaborate prayers to God, Buddha, the angels, and all the unicorns asking for snow. The few times it actually happened were better than any Christmas or birthday. Queen's Park would be teeming with shrill children on slow toboggans, soggy, stressed parents herding them around like livestock. 
there'd always be tears on the way home, red cheeks, blue fingers, and heavy wet feet trudging down the hill through melting snow. That, that was um, Martha Harris's short story in All the Things I've Grown, read by Elise Harbert. In Friends Don't Do That by Constanza Chodo, read by Irene Saviozzi, Lily and Alex have been friends for years. But when Alex goes to visit her in her new house in London for a week, their relationship begins to change in ways they did not expect. She's calling. Alex removes his headphones as soon as he sees her name appearing on the screen. He closes his laptop, grabs his phone and quickly moves to the bed. He nails deeply, then presses the green button on the screen. He feels his body depressurizing as soon as Lily's face appears. Hey, she says. Alex and Lily have been FaceTiming each other a lot in the past month. They're both in their exam season, so they've, they've been spending a lot of time at home just studying. They've also been messaging each other every day since he left London. Alex likes talking to Lily because he feels free to speak his mind with her. He doesn't care whether she agrees with him or not because she never judges him and he finds it funny when she tries to persuade him to agree on her ideas, which she usually never does. He's never had this kind of friendship with a girl before. So how did it go? He asks her. Lily has had a video presentation earlier in the morning that day. She worked on a project on body dysmorphia with other girls that, like her, in the course of their life have been affected by their disorder. The night before, Lily sent Alex the video she was going to present. The visuals have shown parts of different female bodies. It took him a few seconds to realize that the video included frames of Lily's hands, her belly, her feet, her legs, and so on. When he did, he felt his body flush with heat. His own reaction embarrassed him. He avoided responding to Lily for an hour, and even when he did, he tried to be as detached as possible. It went amazingly, Lily exclaims. Everyone liked it. That's great. Alex says. Did they give you a grade? Not yet, but they will soon. Alex, I'm so happy. They said the video was expressive and accurate in terms of the subject, and they described the, visual, the visuals as elegant and intimate. Alex feels his body flushing again and pauses the call. Alex? He hears Lily's voice saying. Sorry, one second. I'm just replying to Corinne's texts. Oh. She says. What is she saying? Alex opens his chat with Corinne and reads the last messages out loud to Lily. They're from two days ago. Alex and Corinne have been talking almost as much as he and Lily have in the past month. She's been telling him about her experience in Finland and how amazing it is that they have so many hours of daylight. She has also invited him to visit her during the summer as she will not be back until September. Alex felt a sense of satisfaction at this. When he told Lily, she said that he didn't sound very excited about it. That pissed him off, but mostly because it was true. You decided when you're going to leave for Finland? Lily asks. Not yet. Alex replies. But I will soon. Can you come back to the FaceTime now? Yeah. Alex glances at his face in the square mirror on his wall, then reopens FaceTime. Did you not like it? What? My video. Lily continues in a serious tone. I feel like you didn't like it. I did. You didn't show much enthusiasm about it. There is a tone of disappointment in her voice which she cannot bear, especially since he did like the video a lot. I'm not an enthusiastic person. You know that. Lily's eyes are low and she's playing with the cable of her earphones. Is it because I'm in it? She asks hesitantly. What? Does that make you uncomfortable? Why would it make me uncomfortable? Lily stays silent for a moment. Then she smiles and says, Okay, never mind. It's great work, really. As all your films are. Thanks. Alex knows that she's upset. But he's glad she's pretending not to be because he wouldn't know what to say. He's thinking about something funny to tell her when she says that she has to go and that she'll text him later to let him know the great she gets. When she hangs up, Alex lets his phone fall on the mattress and sighs. Lately, he's been feeling under pressure at the thought that Lily might like him. Rationally, he knows that's not likely to be, but... He can't avoid to notice that their relationship has changed since he went to London. Not only they talk more often, they talk in a different way. Especially Lily. She talks to him about anything that goes through her mind, and that's 
when she sometimes crosses the boundaries. Alex has been trying to make her notice because he usually doesn't know how to react when she does it. But Lily always dismisses it by saying that's something that friends do. One time while they were talking on the phone, she asked him to tell her what he thinks of her. And he replied that that's something his ex used to ask him. So what? Lily retorted, but eventually she dropped the topic. Another time they were talking about sex and she asked him if it was true that he would never have sex with her. That took him by surprise. He replied he'd never have sex with a friend of his because friends don't do that. Lily manifested a disagreement and added that she's had sex with some friends of hers in the past. Yeah. And how did it end? Alex asked him. But I'm still friends with all of them, so... I don't Lily think I did too. Alex said in his defence. I think I'd be very cringy because I'd never know where to draw the line anymore. Yeah, I get it. I think it's very subjective. What do you mean? It might not work for you, but it's always right for me. You're trying to get me to have sex with you? Alex says to then. I don't know. Would you like to? That response left him speechless. Then Lily burst out laughing and he sighed in relief. It's that kind of things that confuse him. He's pretty sure Lily has never done it before, so there must be a reason why she's doing it now. Maybe not, he thinks, getting up from the bed and sitting back at his desk. That was, that was Friends Don't Do That by Constanza Ciordo. It was read by Irene Saviocci with Elise Hubbard and TJ Roderick. Next up, we will have um, a PowerPoint um, of posters by Ella Monorai. Um, it is called How to Move Around in Silence. It is a series of posters detailing intimate visions of famous cities. It will be read by Lewis Pickles. need to share this. How to Run Against Time or Berlin. I drank gin and broke the glass. I felt cold. I spoke about monogamy and smoked more than I should have, but above all, I ran against time. My cousins were trying to escape from there, but that was my escape. The house with the seven-year-old boy who spoke three languages. The economic student who wanted to go to Prague. We walked around the city together. They said they had no money and stood outside as I went to the museum. They said I was quiet. It was true. I spent the entire trip observing how other people moved. I chose Berlin because I didn't know the language. It wasn't like French or Spanish, languages I could grasp at the borders. Nothing made sense. The city forced me to focus on vision, on smell, on eye contact. I felt the rain on me as my cousin looked for a restaurant in an unknown road. I don't remember what we spoke of, but I remember what she was wearing. I remember Lyre playing with her fingers on a candle. I remember the cup I broke at the bar. I remember her hand on my shoulder as the tattoo needle punctured my knee. I remember the sights, but not their names. I remember losing the ring that you gave me and realizing that I was free. The Enduring Ephemeral, or London. Baby lion goes where the islands go. I had spent the whole way singing. The streets were quiet at 5 a.m., but it was already bright outside. I realized then that I had gone the whole way alone, holding nothing but the sound of your crying voice on the phone. 
over there, all the houses looked the same, lined up one after the other until you could no longer tell apart the past and the present. The whole city still felt like a dream a parallel universe in which sitting outside on a mouldy grey sofa waiting for a door to open was justifiable. And there I was, waiting. Answers me, answers me, bedsheets covered in blood from a fall. I opened the curtains because you could barely see my face. I held your hand when we left the room in silence, early so that no one could see. The quote in the front of the notebook I bought just a few weeks before we met. Love introduces new versions of myself whose obscene novelty disgusts me. We despise the versions of ourselves we became with each other. But even then, the city was good to me. The buildings and the sidewalks and the roads, the weather forever changing. The realization that even without you, I'm good. I let my legs take me where they wanted to and yet somehow I ended up back home. And that was Ella Monterey's How to Move Around in Silence. And it was read by Lewis Pickle. We are now going to uh, Hannah Down's um, Trouble Women Dream. And it's going to be read by Irene um, Sassorachi. Um, Trouble, Dream, uh, Trouble Women Dream was a collaborative project facilitated through social media where Hannah collected her followers' nightmares and used dream interpretation to interpret them and create a unique poem that reflected the sight skies of her generation. Where do our thoughts go when we go to sleep? What does it mean when troubled women dream? She thinks of her father, the scrape on her mind. She longs for a mother holding her tight. She's losing control. He's floating away. She can still hear him screaming her name. She dreams of a bird as majestic as she. He grips her apart with its haunting beak. To love is to give, to twist and to turn. That's what devotion to friends has made her learn. She yearns for a direction, where to go, always with others, but always alone. Her mind is a palace, a damsel that's made, tired of waiting, hidden away. Doesn't get looked at, doesn't get seen. She can't rescue herself. She struggles to breathe. The windows are closed. They're shutting her in until she understands that they are her and she is them. The walls are pretense, the windows are her mind. Only if she opens them will she survive. Where do our thoughts go when we go to sleep? What does it mean when troubled women dream? That was Hannah Down's Troubled Women Dream, and it was read by Irene Sazuras. Next up, we have Baby Teeth by Abida Udin. This tells the story of a young woman after the death of her estranged mother. She and her husband return her to her ancestral home where she's forced to confront its malevolent uh, spirits as well as her own troubled past before it's too late. It will be read by Lewis Pickles.
The whispers are loud, hard voices now, and they compel me to tell Malik the truth. I feel them run riot in my body. They are steering it. A sharp sting fills my cheek after he hits me, and after a few seconds, I can feel pain again. There had been a period of numbness after Giza's death. I climbed into the bathtub to wash away the dark, runny stuff her eyes had been made up of. It had gone all over my clothes, you see. That's when Malik comes home in a frenzy. He tells me we have to leave, but I don't want to. I have business with this house, something he will never understand. I hold the place where he has hit me. Somewhere in this house, the pipes burst and wail. Malik has hit me so hard that my nose is bleeding. In the reflection of the water, I can see that face again. The one of the guest with no mouth. Now, I'm unsure if it is a guest. Maybe it's been here longer than I have. The ripple of its brown eyes remind me of my father, even though I have never met him. Get up! The thick vein between his brows start to throb. I watch him cry. My stomach rolls in excitement. It is as if suddenly I don't know where I start and the voices end. Maybe we are one in the same. We're going home. What is there to go home to? The bathtub is warm. Like what I imagine a mother's tender embrace would feel like. Even after hearing what I have done, he doesn't want to leave me here. What will he do to me once we get home? I've never been afraid of Malik. No one could be with nightmares like mine. I don't think I could be scared of anything else. I shut my eyes for a moment and I can see the guest painted on the back of my eyelids. It lowers its hood again and hands me something. I can't quite make out what it is until I open my eyes again. The cold press of a needle in my hand. He'll never understand your pain like I do. Let him go. Cut, bleed, release. That's when I lurch forward and stab his arm with the needle, pushing its contents into his veins whilst he's still in shock. Goodbye, my beautiful lover. I think you'll be happier now, returning to the poison that made you. The poison that made your mother. Let me return to mine. It spreads quickly. Malik convulses. He foams at the mouth before I realise what I've really done. His eyes turn into pools of milky yellow. I stand up quickly as his body slumps into the water. His visage becomes part of what I see in the guest's reflection. Silence returns like dawn, but this sense of ease is fleeting. The house has me alone now. We have each other not for long. As I walk downstairs barefoot, the floorboards shudder and quake. I go into the tool shed outside and fumble around for something, anything. My eyes settle on an ax. Mold. I need to get rid of the mold somehow. I can't sell the house if it's rotting. Can't sell the house if there are dead bodies in every room. The house knows what I'm trying to do. The roots of the hedges around me grow like arms and reach for me as I run back towards the house. I drag the axe across the tiles and images of the dead flash before my eyes. It occurs to me that the dead are what make locust grow. Without them, it would have nothing. What is locust grove if not the worst parts of me, my mother, my father, my husband. Growing up, 
I had always known love to come from the heart, but I was wrong. It's the stomach. Entrenched in the very bowels of this house, the wine cellar, the rot, the flood, I make my way down there and notice how it's starting to fill quickly with water again. It's at my ankles, and then my knees. If I don't take care of the rot now, it will consume me too. I thought it would never hurt me. Maybe it's just playing games, testing my will to live. I let it know that I've killed before and I will do it again. Lights go out. I hear every single bulb in the house explode one by one. You've taken too much from me and now I'm here to take it all back. With that, I lift the axe over my head and bring it down on the throbbing, cancerous masses of mould on the wall. And that's when the ceiling above me starts to crumble, like the ceiling of the underworld itself. Even the fires of Tartarus would not be able to stay alive in a place like this. After all these years, I get it now. This is where things come to die. A lump forms in my throat. Like Geyser had said, the house was selfish. It didn't really love me. Not the way I've been looking to be loved all my life. The only person who could have done that, who could have offered me that respite, is dead herself. They both are. My parents. Those who brought me into this world, though the house thinks different. An ominous boom, like thunder, echoes through the house, but I keep my eyes fixated on the brick and plaster before me. I know after this it can never hurt me again. I hack away at the wall again and I start to cry, mourning all those years I lost to my own despair because, because I thought my mother never loved me, that no one ever would. That was... Sorry. Um, that was Baby Teeth by Abida Odin, read by Lewis Pickles. Next, we will have CJ Roderick, who will read Marianne Isaac's Forget Me Not. When 39 year old Eamon collapses in front of a convenience store in London, he finds himself waking up in a different reality, one from his traumatic and forgotten past 20 years ago in Mogadishu. The cat looks deep into my eyes before screeching in agony. It slowly dissolves into the fresh graves that have just emerged from the ground. That's six altogether now. I reach for it and try to grab a paw, but it is too late. The cat is gone. There is no hug from the flowers this time. Instead, I feel the numbing connection of a solid object with the back of my head. My skull vibrates and I am put to sleep. It is morning, but the gunshots are silent. Instead, the roosters that would harmonize with the call for Fajr Salah are especially loud and almost insistent. I see an image of Abo choking on his own blood. The image doesn't stay for long, but the burn mark it has imprinted makes it hard for me to think about anything else. Eventually, I throw up until the only offering my stomach has left is green bile. I feel the tickle of sweat on my forehead and wipe it off. I would do anything at this point to ease the pain in my head, even for a fraction of a second. I would do anything to see Adam again. You're bleeding. The voice comes from beside me. My hand travels back to the wetness on my head. What happened to me? They brought you here last night with your brother. Adam's here. I look around in the small room. There are boys scattered all around. They all look bruised and beaten. My head feels like a hammer is lodged into it. Where is... They took him away this morning. He looks as young as Ahmed, but sounds a lot older. The room we are in bursts open and two men with rifles come inside. They scan the room before making their way to a sleeping teenager. 
They drag him to his feet and march out with him. They've been doing that all morning, taking us one by one. Why? He shrugs in response to my question. This adds a hint of innocence to his stern features. I've heard rumors they are looking for relatives of Omar Hussein. Who's that? You don't know him? He shifts his body towards me and stares in awe. I admit the name sounds familiar, but I can't remember why. He's the one who led the coup last year. His sons are missing. It is another boy sitting behind me. His voice is so quiet. I almost miss what he says. The name takes shape in my memories now. Omar Hussein was a good friend of my father. I heard my abo say they won't stop this war until they cut off his bloodline completely. Your brother told me to tell you not to say anything to them. What do you mean? I'm not too sure. They dragged him out before he finished that sentence. He leans in before whispering. I'm guessing it's to do with, you know, being a Darude. A tortured wail cuts through the momentary silence. A teenage boy is rocking himself back and forth. Each movement forward touches his forehead with a stone wall. He looks about Adam's age. I can't help but stare in wonder. I've never seen a boy Adam's age cry before. I've never seen Adam cry in my entire life. His whole family was killed in front of him. He's been like that for two days. You've been here for two whole days. Some of us have been here longer. You see that boy with the bald head in the corner? He's been here since the war started. What about your family? The ship they boarded left me behind. The sounds of gunshots vibrate in and out of the closed windows. I rest my head on the cool wall behind me and try to piece how Adam and I had come to this place, to enemy territory. The last thing I remember is my father's murder. The image is a consistent replay in my mind. I wrap my arms around myself. I wonder if Huya knows what's happened by now. I wonder if she will blame me. It is two days later when it's my turn to leave with the men. I'm so weak that I'm almost glad of their support as they drag me from both sides. I'm in a dark room. The stench of blood reminds me of the goats we sacrificed on Eid, only more pungent. I want to vomit, but there's nothing for my stomach to discharge. Men sitting on stools behind a small desk laugh and chat, oblivious to my presence. When they finally pay attention, they turn solemn, cold. Eamon is your name, correct? Yes, uncle. I am not your uncle. A hard kick on my hip bone sends me down, but the men holding me up force me to stand. Your brother has already told us everything. We just need your confirmation. I stay silent, remembering the message that Adam had left behind for me. We know your tribe already. Don't worry, we won't kill you for being a Darud. We just need to know about your family tree, your names. They want to know if I am related to Omar Hussein. I am not but I keep silent anyway. He pauses as he waits for my eyes to meet his. He smiles, showing sharp yellow teeth that stand out on his dark face. I know he sees the fear in my eyes. We are God-fearing people. We keep our words. Tell me you and your family's names and I will let you go. I recall my father's last moments. His last words were God-fearing. The prophet was God-fearing when he spared his enemies. This man is not God-fearing. I can feel it in the way the curve of his smile mirrors the shape of the knife he is holding. I keep my silence. If there's anything I've ever excelled in, it's in following instructions. The one time I failed, my father died. I won't let it happen again. We have your mother. And that was TJ Roderick reading Marianne Isaac's Forget Me Not. We will take a short intermission now, uh, five minutes. And um, so we will be back at um, 17.58, uh, well, yeah, in five minutes. And um, so see you then.
Welcome back. Hopefully you're all here still with me. Welcome back to Goldsmith Degree Show, where we are celebrating the classes of creating writing from media, communication and cultural studies and media and English classes of 2021. Um, I hope you're all back. And um, we will continue with uh, Neves Fennels under the Banya tree, which will be read by TJ Roderick. September 4th, I had a most frightful dream. I was led down a path in somewhere almost like Harpar Villa. There were rows of great trees. Each had a niche carved into the trunk with long steel bars entrapping their habitants. As we went on, there was an unusual stench that became increasingly unbearable with every step. A condemned man was made to kneel at the end of the track. His head made to touch his ankles because of the thick iron rivets bound to his neck and around his legs. He stood as Ken to the path of torture. My feet moved me towards him. As I passed through the trees, I noticed one niche held a mess of flesh. A man of sorts. His skin was stripped and indiscernible organs trailed the earth. How strange the magnet of horror that draws us to it. I kept walking down and down the path. Out of the ground, I rose a step, another step and another. Suddenly there were thousands of steps going up and up and up. Or was it down and down and down? I followed my legs. The closer I got to her, the sharper the cadaverous odor became. Time moved excruciatingly slowly, dread welled up inside of me. She sat at the very top in chiaroscuro. Beneath her was an osseous throne. Her eyes so cruel impaled mine. Her tongue ran over her teeth, stopping at the sharpest cusp and pushed hard until blood was staining her chin. My body moved closer. She loomed overhead. All around, from above and below, there was silence, chilling my core. I dare not speak. Is this her? Her immobility and silence troubled me. I stared and her pupils ran down her cheeks like inky streams until all that was left was sclera. She descended from her perch, pushing her face towards mine. Pestilential whispers slowly and sinisterly flowed out of her cruel mouth. A repulsive smile spread across her face. She lifted her talons, tearing into her stomach, black gushing out. Deeper and deeper she went, more and more she laughed. She pulled a bundle of bleeding flesh, a litter with a heartbeat, and placed it on my chest. It was warm and dead. I could feel the contours of a small arm. She cackled all the while. September 7th. At quarter to four on Tuesday morning, Wei Lin began screaming. We rushed to the hospital. She said something felt wrong. She had a sensation like a pulling in her stomach. I cannot remember if I wrote my last letter before or after this incident, but my dreams seem to have imitated life, or perhaps life has imitated my dreams. We have lost the baby. Everything is so quiet, so still, as if I, or rather we, are caught in a vacuum. I can see the world just beyond the clear gelatinous film moving at normal speed, but here, where I float, we are paused. We moved through the house parallel, almost mirroring, but never intersecting. We both felt simultaneously a silence, perhaps a peace descend upon us. The world has been swallowed by the force of one thought. I can't help but think, why me? I feel like I've been unlucky in this life. First you, my brother, and then so many others. Now my child too. Am I the Midas of death? Neither Wei Lin nor I went to the funeral. 
I hear people arriving at our door, perhaps to comfort us, to share condolences. I told Anna Marie to send them all away. Raylin needs peace, not the interference of busybodies. How can they share this feeling, this feeling of nothingness? I feel nothing, no pain, no sadness, nothing. Dozens of vases litter the living room, white flowers, yellow flowers, and the occasional pink. The petals do not smell like they ought. In that room, the air is heavy and full with putrid scent. September 16th. For some time, I have stopped understanding Wei Lin. Perhaps we never understood one another. I had always observed her, but could I always comprehend what I saw? She had decided once and for all to withdraw from the present, falling into fits of abstraction. When she was like this, I practically fled from her, wishing that in a few hours or so she would be more natural. Wei Lin spends most days and every night in the baby's nursery. I cannot bear to go in there and she cannot bear to be apart from it. We live together, but she stands alone on the other side. A silence fills the house. I tried to talk to her. Do you recall my love when I met you at? You were being followed by an auntie offering you flowers from her basket. Do you recall? And that evening I came home with all those flowers. I'd even bought the basket of her. I came in and at first you treated me with coldness, like you do now. What was wrong with you then? I can't remember, but the scent was so strong. The room filled with it almost instantaneously and you could not help but smile. You reveled in their perfume. Isn't it funny how now we can't stand the smell of the flowers downstairs. She did not respond. Did not even turn to look at me. I stayed in the doorway a while. She sat motionless in the planter's chair. As I turned to leave, she called me, beckoning me to come into the room with her. I dare not cross into the threshold of that room. I dare not investigate what has become of her mind. Was there some part of me crying in those earlier moments? Someone was groaning, weeping, crying, praying to the Lord, beseeching for forgiveness, pleading for help. His prayers were unheard. He did not receive any light from above. There was no truth or peace, no resting in the clemency of a God. At night, there are these strange noises. It is true that strange noises are to be expected when you live away from the city, but what little wilderness the island has, at only our doorstep. Maybe there has always been strange noises, but now that I no longer sleep, these noises obsess my exhausted mind. Does the sound keep me awake? Or is it because I stay awake that I hear the sound? All night long, I stare, unsleeping at the beams in the roof. I hear a howl. I wonder if Wei Lin is crying for what we have lost. Somewhere in the house, a shutter slams. Did the forecast say the air would be still? Sweaty tears run down my body, the air stagnant. I kick off the sheet and roll over into the empty space where she used to sleep. I close my eyes, but sleep never comes. The shutter continues to bang somewhere in the house. The howling never ceases. That was Nia Fennels under the Banya tree, read by TJ Roderick. And it is about the newlywed Ben and Wei Leng, who has recently moved to moved house to accommodate the arrival of their first child. As the baby's due date approaches, an unsettling feeling begins to permeate the walls of their perfect house and tension grows, estranging the couple. Next up, we have um, Katharina Spork, who um, wrote a song or the lyrics for a song for her friend Eliana Sander Weinberger, who will be joining us. The song is called Arms and it is about the sorrow behind fame and was inspired by the life and death of Marilyn Monroe. 
um, it will be um, the music and uh, was was composed by Eliana Sander Van Berger and she's here to sing it in person. Hi, hi. Just gonna quickly a little sound check whether to, to, to check whether you can hear me well. Yeah. Can you hear the piano? Yeah, we can hear you. Perfect. Okay. Well, I will start then. <clears throat> Thank you so much. That was Arms by Katarina Sporkett and Eliana Sander Weinberger. Next, we have Arusha Kali's Adira of Ananda, which is a mythological take on the consequences of colonialism. It will be read by Irina Saviocci. Christopher Allington was a pompous young man who spent his days drinking in his lavish manner and his nights drinking at tavern. Though he was heir to one of the largest trading companies in the country, he did very little to learn about the responsibility that comes with it. Sick and tired of his son's behavior, James Allington threatened to disown him if he did not get his life in order. He said to Christopher, for generations, every man in our family has spent years away at sea, 
learning the craft of sailing the high seas and finding new trade routes. It is now your turn. If you don't, then you're a disgrace to the Arlington name and can bid adieu to your inheritance. Scared of losing his fortune, Christopher begrudgingly agreed. He summoned a group of skilled navigators and explorers to accompany him in his journey and set sail a few weeks later. The journey was harrowing and they would often have to endure extreme conditions. Still, Christopher persevered for he was determined to succeed and fight to keep his inheritance. One morning, he was awoken to the noise and chatter of his crew. After weeks and months of sailing, they had finally come across a sign of land. He rushed to the front of the ship's deck and pulled out his compass. If he was right, the land they had found was Ananda, the land of eternal bliss. He rushed to his lead navigator to confirm his findings, and to his delight, he was right. They docked their ship at the shore. Christopher stepped onto the land with his crew behind him, only to be stopped by a figure. The figure was of a woman named Zadira, the protector of Ananda. Let us through, said Christopher, but Adira did not budge. Her figure kept growing bigger and bigger. Let us through now, said Christopher again, trying to sound tough. Only on one condition, she responded. Yes? You will leave this land the way you found it. Not a single thing should be out of place or missing. You have my word. Adira stepped aside to reveal the sacred and untouched land that Christopher had discovered. The land was lush and green. The flowers, plants and trees were of colors and shapes he had never seen before. The animals had luscious, silky fur and had a gleam in their eyes. They were the most majestic animals Christopher had ever seen. Even the sun shone brighter here than it did back home. She let the man pass, pass through and into the land that she had sworn to always protect. They walked for miles through the meadows, through the hills and through the woods until they come across a river that was as clear as a diamond. Tired and exhausted from the voyage, they decided to set up the tents for the night. Christopher walked to the river in order to quench his thirst. He bent down to collect some water in his palms and took a sip. His face lit up with joy. This is the best water I have ever tasted. He ran back to his men and invited them to try the water from the river themselves. One by one, his men took a sip from the river and it was as if all the fatigue had disappeared. They had the same response. If the water from a river is so delicious, what would the fruits taste like? While walking back to the campsite, Christopher spotted the tree. He rushed to it and plucked the fruit out of the tree. He took one bite of it and it was like an explosion of flavors in his mouth that they had never tasted before. He called out to his crew. Bring a basket with you and come taste this slice of the heaven I found. Eagerly, he started plucking all the fruits of the tree. A few of his crew members walked to him with baskets in their hands. He spent the rest of the day looking for more trees to gather fruits from and any kind of food he could find. They only stopped when the trees were bare and there were no animals left in sight. They trekked back to their campsite where Adira was waiting for their return. Christopher and his men kept walking, completely oblivious to Adira's presence. As she spoke, she grew bigger and bigger. You betrayed me. You broke your word and now you shall pay for it. Adira lifted her arms and smashed all their tents. A ball of fire arose from her palms and she set their belongings on fire. She reached for Christopher and held him upside down. Help me now, he cried. The crew members, terrified of Adira's wrath, ran towards the ship ready to escape the place. Christopher tried to fight her. He tried to wiggle out of her grip, but he was unsuccessful. Still raging, she walked to his ship. The crew members were sitting, was getting the ship ready to leave. Not so easily. A ball of fire appeared in her other hand and she launched it towards the ship. The sound of the flames drowned the cries of the crew's members out. Don't ever come back here, Adira says as she flung Christopher onto the burning ship. She moved the water in the ocean, which formed big waves and took the ship deeper into the ocean. The ship still roams the seven seas, burning to this day. It is a reminder of Christopher's actions, haunting any travelers voyaging the seas that set the curse with similar intentions in mind. And that was Arushi's Adira of Ananda, and it was read by Irene Saviacci. 
Next up, we will have Elise Harper back, and now she will present and read her poetic collection, Blood, Sweat and Tears, about having a vagina. It's a scene folded from one page containing four poems and illustrations by Elise, allowing a space to discuss periods, sexual pleasure, and all things vagina. She will be performing this piece herself. Bleeding on bed sheets and bloated bellies make for difficult mornings. When the river runs red, my tummy becomes a mountain. She is soft and tender, with stretch marks cascading down her as if the crevices between the rocks. When the river runs red, my back becomes an oak tree. Her bark is cracking, but she stands tall while moaning into the wind as if singing a song of her pain. When the river runs red, my vagina becomes a waterfall. She is overflowing, splashing into the water to create bloody puddles, as if the river is bleeding herself. All great Neptune's ocean will wash this blood clean from my hand, yet I know it will return in waves. My shame so white for something so human that comes in with the moon each month. If you dive into the waterfall, head first and dripping wet, you will find a pearl at the bottom of the ocean. Touch her gently and she will tell you a story of her history, of how she was carved by the goddess of pleasure, painted in gold iridescence and placed onto a pink satin cushion, patiently waiting for someone to feel her power. And that was Elise Har Harbert with uh, her blood, sweat and tears about having a vagina. Next up, we will have a scene from Joel D'Agostino's film script, A Pleasant Journey to Mars, which will be performed by um, uh, Elise Harper, Phil, uh, Phil, Philip Palmer, Louis Pickles, TJ Roderick and Irene Saviacci. A Pleasant Journey to Mars. It's a futuristic tragic comedy about a failing entertainer who is tasked with keeping a hen party amused on their two trip, two month trip to Mars on a budget airline. Just a quick content warning for this one. It includes sex, sexual references. <clears throat> 2107. In the lucrative Mars travel market, English budget spaceliner Get to Mars offers cheap, fast journeys to the city of Utopia, Mars, at unbeatable prices. Under British law, every space bus is required to carry an onboard entertainer to ensure that passengers can enjoy a pleasant journey to Mars. At the Jet Bridge, Watford Spaceport. An ultra-modern extendable corridor lined with screens showing images of a sparkly city on Mars. An artificial female voice speaks on the intercom. Miss K. Banarazil, please make your way to Gate B for the 1445 Get to Mars Space Abyss flight to Utopia, Mars. That's Miss K. Banarazil. Crew are waiting to depart. Thank you. Wheels screech. A compact robot metal food and drinks trolley zooms round the corner and hurtles towards the open door of the space bus. A get to Mars attendant, Julie, steps out of the way. She is short and has a beaming round face, shiny black hair, and she is dressed in a light blue spacesuit with orange and white stripes and the get to Mars logo. Oh, careful trolley. Sorry, Julie. Julie is holding a tablet in one hand and checks her watch. Then she looks at the male attendant, Alan, next to her. He is very camp, completely bold and has a cheeky smile. A single stud earring and a spacesuit matching Julie's. Where the fuck is he? Sorry, sorry. Ed scurries down the corridor, struggling with a huge sack of toys and a rucksack slung over his shoulder. He has drooping cheeks, receding what? hair, and he wears a velvet blue shirt and flares, and an orange waistcoat duped with white spots. That bloody machine never bloody recognises me. 
<laughs> You're late. <laughs> Ed gets to the doorway and passes the sack to Alan. Here, take that for us, will you? Alan takes the grown tube out of the sack and examines it. What's this? Turn it upside down. Alan rotates the tube and it makes a groaning noise. You know it's a hen party, right? A hen party? Alan smiles with discontent and stuffs the tube back in. Did you not check the itinerary? Well, what might do? Just put it on the floor in my cabin, will you? Alan sighs and enters the ship with Ed's sack. Ed puffs out his cheeks when... Screaming. Ed and Julie look down the corridor where five women have just turned the corner. Jojo, Anastasia, Staranese, and Luciana and Saxon are all dressed in matching white spacesuits and alien-eared headbands. They are each wheeling along suitcases. Jojo is carrying a large inflatable penis. We're here! Yeah! Oh my god, amazing look star! Ed looks at Julie and rolls her eyes. Anastasia starts waving manically at Ed and Julie. She strides towards them. Miss Cabanera? My name's Julie and I will be looking after you for the next 10 weeks. Lovely. And it's Carbonara Zeal. Like passion or zest. Such a beautiful name. Anastasia quickly points to each of the other women. That's Star Anise, my daughter. She points at Star Anise, who has a round glittered cheek. Luch and Sachs, who are Jojo's besties. Anastasia hovers her hand in the direction of Luciana. She has beautiful bouncy black hair and a sparkling nose piercing. Saxon has drawn on eyebrows at right angles. And Jojo, the bride-to-be and my new-to-be sister-in-law. Anastasia then points to Jojo, who is always squinting, either with dissatisfaction or delight, but it's never quite clear. Congratulations, Jojo. Thanks, Sax. This is Ed. Uh, he's our onboard entertainer. Anastasia shakes Ed's hand. Oh, I'm looking forward to being entertained, aren't you girls? Right then. Uh, if you'd all like to follow me, you can leave your suitcases here and myself and Alan will take them for you. Thank you so much for inviting me, Jojo. I absolutely love Mars. Never been, but I love all the holiday snaps I've seen, so... Oh, Saxon, shut up for a second. It's not all about you. Saxon frowns submissively as they follow Julie on board. Inside Ed's cabin of the space bus. The cabin is small and stuffy. Ed drops his rucksack on the floor beside the stack of toys. A screen folds down from the ceiling and starts playing a vid video of a digitized Captain Joe, incredibly handsome and chiseled with perfect hair. He's directly addressing the camera. Hello and welcome aboard this Get to Mars space bus. My name is Captain Joe and I will be guiding you through this journey. Please make your way to the passenger deck for liftoff. Your cabin will be locked until we are safely in space. Ed sits on the bed and looks out of the porthole at the grey metropolis off in the distance. It is choking in smog. You will require your spacesuit and helmet. Everything else, including all hand luggage, must remain in your cabin. Get to Mars hopes you, have a, you enjoy a pleasant journey to Mars. Ed picks up his helmet and wipes the visor with his sleeve. Inside the passenger deck of the space bus, the passenger deck has 20 seats, five rows of two on either side of the central aisle. Alan is conducting a safety briefing. Ed enters carrying his helmet dressed in a space suit. Due to air pressure, the artificial gravity will not be initiated until the seatbelt sign turns off. Ed takes the nearest seat, puts his helmet on and twists it until it locks. He then fastens his seatbelt. This is your captain speaking. They all whoop and laugh. Show us your cockpit! Anastasia and Star Anise look at each other and giggle. Please prepare for liftoff. Julie and Alan check everyone's helmets. Julie gets to Jojo, who is cuddling her inflatable penis. I'm afraid I'm going to have to deflate that. Oh, shove off. It's her hand party for crying out loud. It's a health and safety issue. It will explode. <laughs> Won't be the first time, will it, Jojo? Anna. Julie reaches forward and grabs the penis. Jojo reluctantly lets go and Julie deflates it. The deck vibrates as the engines rumble awake. Luciana, in the front row, shakes dramatically and her eyes widen. I don't want to do this. No, I can't. I can't. She rummages around, trying to unclip her seatbelt. Anastasia leans forward and strokes Luciana's shoulder. Babe, it's all right. Just breathe. Remember, like we practiced. I can't. I hate space, you know I do. 
Julie looks up from the back to see what's happening. Luciana struggles as she unclips her seatbelt. Sit Three. down, Lucy. You sit back down right now. Don't you dare ruin this for Jojo. She's been waiting for this day since she was five. Two, one, lift off. Don't you dare. Anastasia grabs Luciana's shoulders. Let go of me. A huge blast as they are boosted into space. Earth races past the windows. Luciana shakes violently, her teeth chattering. Star Anise trembles and groans. She vomits and peers down at the mess inside her helmet. Oh, God. She burps and brings up more. Jojo avoids looking anywhere as she rocks back and forth in a trance. Help! Luciana crashes into the ceiling. Star Anise sits sulking, smelling, gagging, as they get higher and higher into the atmosphere. Her vomit floats upwards inside her helmet and she struggles to keep her head above it. Ed leans back and presses the radio button on the side of his helmet. Everything goes quiet. He shuts his eyes and relaxes. Thank you, everyone. Um, and thank you for an incredible, um, incredible evening and pieces, and especially to our actors um, who have put in a lot of work. Um, everyone in this year wrote amazing pieces, and Philip and I would like to take tonight as an opportunity to honor all of that hard work. Um, so what we would really like is anyone watching um, on the live stream, do come and join us. Everyone turn on the cameras, including the actors. And um, we will um, share a PowerPoint here. Um, um, hold on. Um, Okay. Um, first up is um, Sinye Bay, um, who wrote two pieces for the class, uh, Maelstrom. Oops, this is not gonna go, hold on. This is my wrong one, stop sharing. I will try that again. Um, um, uh, This should do it, but I'm gonna I'm gonna have to go all the way. I'm sorry, I'm gonna get there. All right. First time, huge congratulations to everyone um, from the the creator writing team, and this is still doing it. Um, so let um, I cannot stop it. Hold on. I will get there. Um, I was sure automatic alone PowerPoint. This was why is it not that one? Okay. Um, okay, this should no. Okay, I will I'm sorry, I'm just gonna need to stop um, recording. And because um, otherwise I can't do anything. I will get there. Okay. Um, I'm almost there, sorry. Um, okay, this should not have things in it. Okay. 
Let me just be sure before I start again. All right. So great congratulations to everyone. Um, you really did amazing work. Uh, Senya Bay wrote a, a prose piece, two prose pieces, um, sort of um, about a prose piece called Maelstrom and um, an installation really uh, called 144 Days. Uh, Maelstrom is a heartfelt story about a music student and her obsession and love affair with a professor. And her 144 Days is a break for, uh, breakup beautifully pictured by images on a girl's desk. Joel D'Agostino, as we heard tonight, uh, an excerpt of his um, uh, A Pleasant Journey to Mars. Um, and he also did this marvelous um, combination of mediums, chats, letters, et cetera, telling a crime story called Murderous Bitch Who's Done It. Hannah Downs, aside from the wonderful idea and her collection of uh, a poem um, showing um, on um, the collecting dreams from followers on Instagram and writing the poems that we heard tonight. She wrote a feminist script with a dramatic twist. Daisy disappeared in high school, presumed murdered, only there is so much more to that story. Nikki Dulaku um, took us for a visit to hell in the company of a cat whose human owner had committed suicide. She also began an idea of a retro computer game about a witch who can't do magic, one um, all of us are longing to play. Alexia Beatrice Guglielmi, aside from the picture book that we saw tonight, she also wrote what will hopefully be become a collection of, for her of uh, Filipino myths. And it started with um, the piece she did for the class, Luval Hati and the First Owl. It's a beautiful and touching tale of death and attacks and colonialisms of the moon-faced people. Alicia Harbert, we heard blood, sweat and tears, uh, her poignant, provocative and sensitive scene, but she also wrote a script um, for tonight where we are part of a one night stand in modern day London of Tinder and social media. Katerina Sporch collaborated with her friends as we heard, um, in a beautiful song, but she also wrote a TV pilot called In the Hot Waters and set in a publishing house facing a commercial takeover with excellent characters and no ending drama. George Tapper was inspired by his local pub at the end of university to write a romance. The Royal Scots tell the story of a relationship from the beginning through to the end. His um, shorter piece, a backseat investigator as a fun uh, radio drama from the perspective of a child detective. Sarah Roy was inspired by COVID to write the videotapes, a script set on Manhattan, when a group of friends, figuratively speaking, tear each other to pieces when trick into, tricked into revealing their innermost secrets. Sarah also treated us to a short story of a boy who didn't want to grow up, only to find that he is dead. Arusha Kali, aside from her beautiful fairy tale that we heard tonight, also wrote a TV pilot across time of a wonderful time traveling character, Adira, who comes back to Victorian times and the great exhibition to steal the Kuinu diamond and change the world or the future. Ethan Herlock Laird will hopefully take this uh, further into a full novel he wrote. Um, he wrote, used his unique style and tone of voice to write a young adult story with um, called um, Shaman, um, telling a story of the last days and the end of school. Martha Harris, we heard her, um, we heard the beginning of this short story, All the Things I've Grown, which is a coming of age story where a daughter comes, uh, face, um, faces her anger and disappointment and a short story called Dust and Water. Um, um, Dust and Water Make Mud, sorry. Her short story, Dust and Water Make Mud is a well-written tale of almost death and relationship. Victoria Bay, this year she wrote a funny pilot um, for a six episode series, Mom Fuck You, about a dysfunctional family, which I believe was inspired by her own. 
um, who finds suddenly everyone living at home after their mothers die. Um, she also wrote a beautiful and heartbreaking short story of a family without a future. Ella Monorat wrote, um, showed us the wonderful, marvelous posters of capital cities. She did this one more um, than the ones we saw. She also was inspired by COVID to write a story of a spooky virus that uh, uh, has begun due to global warming where people spontaneously burst into flames. Owen McDonald's who um, uh, wrote the astral watchtower a sci-fi of two brothers, a missing father, swapping bod bodies, search for answers and the truth. And he also wrote that rather creepy short story that punishes uh, criminals for their past. Melina Ribaiti wrote a wonderful piece um, telling the story of Anna's best friend Lilith, crime and mental illness keeps us in suspense until the end to who's telling the story and what story and the truth and what really happened. Melina also wrote a sweet collection of poems, Honeymoon, talking about love. It has been amazing working with all of you, all everything you did, um, all the variety of stories have just been absolutely beautiful and it has been a joy despite this unbelievable weird year. Um, I'm impressed with how far you got. I will now hand over to Philip who will introduce me to an English Jennifer Farmer, their third year tutor, unfortunately could not be with us tonight. So um, Philip will take over from me. Thank you so much, Malene. Um, and firstly, I want to kind of thank all of the participants tonight because it's been an amazing and wonderful showcase. Um, one of the most exhilarating uh, we've, we've ever had and uh, a joy to be part of it. So thank you for that. Thank you to the actors. Um, it, it's the, the extraordinary time about this last year is that at a time where the pubs are deserted and the restaurants are closed and the campus itself has been a, a desolate ghost ship um, and all of you have been denied your social activities and normal lives. Despite that creativity has flourished, the quality of work is of such a high standard and, and over and above the quality of creativity, the, the collaboration and the gentleness and the kindness you've shown to each other and support and given each other is, is just wonderful. Um, I only have one regret really, which is that I didn't manage to get to um, join Elise and Martha in their garden where there's a, clearly a copious <laughs> supply of white wine. Um, and that's clearly the place to be this evening. Um, so thank you, Malene, um, for talking about the um, um, media and communication students who you taught over the last two terms and, and celebrated their wonderful work. Uh, I also want to mention our other tutors, um, uh, Louise Tucker and Emma McDonald, who've done who taught in the early years, and Jennifer is the tutor for the uh, MA, uh, BA Media and English students uh, we're about to talk about. Uh, so I want to celebrate their work. Uh, Sapna Begum um, wrote a really compelling and, and um, disturbing and, and very original uh, thriller set in India about child abduction, based on a, on a true story but translated into a different world and culture. Uh, so thank you for that, um, Sapna. And then Costanza Chudo wrote a short story, which we heard an extract from of a, of a friendship between um, Lily and Alex, uh, which may or may not develop into something else. Uh, and it's a really lovely exploration of what it is to be friends um, and the nature of, of, of um, relationships um, in, in today's world. Um, next, we have uh, Leah, Leah Kreis, um, who wrote a script for Last Christmas. Um, about Gary, who is a single dad who's struggling to raise two daughters, um, and who is devastated when he finds out they want to spend Christmas with their mum and not with him. So it's a really lovely exploration of, 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 of a man's anxieties and a family dynamic, and a um, really, really engrossing story. Next, we have uh, Under the Banyan Tree, um, was written by Nee Fennell, um, beautifully illustrated, a really engrossing story. It's an epistolary ghost story. We haven't had many of those over the years, but epistolary meaning that it's written entirely in the form of letters, beautifully presented, uh, really, really creepy, really eerie, um, and very well uh, achieved. So thank you so much, Neve. Um, Costco, look at this wonderful photograph of the boy with the chips. That reminds me so much of my own family. That's exactly the kind of thing that we would do as boys. Um, and this marvelous story by Melissa is set in Cornwall. Um, uh, it's called Costco, which is, I discovered um, through Melissa's work, is the Cornish word for boy. Uh, and it's a, it's a study of a family and a lovely exploration with a wonderful sense of place. 
Uh, Amelia Howarth is the next uh, student to celebrate, who wrote a story called Alec and Bay, uh, in which a man in his 70s, Alex, visits his wife in a care home. She suffers dementia. She's really losing um, her uh, faculties. And, and from something she says, Alex believes that she's um, missing a former lover, uh, someone she knew before him. And rather than being angry, he seeks out the former lover in order to, to uh, put his wife in touch again, which is an, a wonderful selfless act, which doesn't go the way he plans. Um, Marianne Isaac I wrote a story called Forget Me Not. And again, beautifully illustrated with that, that cover image there. It really evokes the, the, the quality of it. It's a haunting magic realist short story about a survivor of the Somali Civil War uh, and the ghost of his brother. The next writer to mention is um, Vedika Maheshwari, um, who wrote um, a story called Corroded. Uh, it's really, really richly researched, uh, deeply felt um, about the crime of vitriolage um, set in India, set in Mumbai. Vitriolage is the crime of throwing acid in a woman's face, and that's what happened to our main character. Um, and despite the horror, despite the pain, she has the strength of will to continue. It's a powerful issue piece, um, and again, uh, written with great heart and sensitivity. Um, Ariana Motegi uh, wrote a screenplay called 40 Years On, um, which is a um, really, really unusual and, and gentle and very touching piece for two men in their 60s uh, who've lived, who are happily married men, uh, who get together and remember that they once were lovers and start rekindling their gay love affair. So it's a really um, gentle, feel good piece. Um, Katya Souza Dimas is our next writer uh, who wrote uh, a um, a very intense and, and richly achieved screenplay called Wounded Healer, uh, about a young woman called Ashley who discovers she is pregnant, has to find a way to deal with her dysfunctional family uh, and the wounds that pass from generation to generation. Um, the next piece I'm going to mention is Baby Teeth, written by uh, Abida, which we heard uh, an extract from, uh, Abida Udin. Uh, it's a haunted house ghost story, uh, which she says is inspired by Shirley Jackson's classic novel, The Haunting of Hill House, uh, but it's very much its own original piece. And I'm getting some great um, support from uh, Elise on, for that mention. Um, and next, uh, Seth Turkwan Cook, um, who wrote a piece about snowboarding and growing up. Uh, the characters are uh, proficient in the amazing sport of snowboarding, and their great dream is to do the most dangerous um, snowboarding flip uh, in order to encounter the big air, as they call it. Uh, it's a really, really funny piece um, and, and, and very observational about um, those growing up years, those teenage years before you, before you come to um, going to university and discovering everything that we discover here. Um, the next writer is uh, Tamina, Tamina Yasmin, who wrote a black comedy, very funny black comedy about two female BFFs, two, two young women who hang out together, have fun, but their main activity in life is, is, is committing ruthless and audacious burglaries. Um, so a really beautifully executed piece. Um, I'll also mention two writers, Finn Cargill and Annie Metra, who are still working on their projects uh, and who are part of this cohort. And again, have been very much part of this, um, this extended family over the, over the last um, year and throughout the three years of the degree. So um, I think that's the last event. So now we're moving on to... Um, uh, Our singer. A wonderful singer. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'll pass um, it back to uh, Mulleen. Thank you, Mulleen, for letting me um, celebrate those writers and their achievements. Yes, uh, congratulations to everyone. <laughs> um, we had um, Alina Sander Weinberger coming and singing beautifully for <clears throat> us today. So we very much appreciate that she came in uh, in a moment break from her classes. So we appreciate that. <laughs> we have uh, um, Luz Pickles, um, who uh, has been helping us out with this, with uh, our um, our, um, last year he was um, wonderfully helpful and we're so pleased to have, have him back and hopefully since he got a job at, a, a, at Goldsmith after having graduated we will have him back next year again um, we are pleased to have uh, TJ Roderick here for the first time um, and um, with wonderful wonderful performances and the same with Irene Savi um, Savicio uh, who is um, also did beautifully reading everyone's work. And now we're to the credits and here we are all back. Um, but since I am 
a Dane and, you know, um, um, let's see if I can make this work. Um, we must celebrate. Okay, I need an actual match. I shall. So I hope you have your drinks. I mean, I'm sure you have had your drinks the whole time. I'm sure I'm hoping. <laughs> um, and I'm going to want you, first of all, I'm going to give you a sparkling thing, which hopefully will work. Here we go. Here we are. The sparkler. <laughs> and sparkler. I need you to help me. Uh, so you need to turn on your sounds. I need you to help me with uh, yeah, um, shouting hoorays, because that is what a Dane would do. So what we're going to do is... Three short ones, hip, hip, hooray, hip, hip, hooray, hip, hip, hooray. And then one long one, hip, hip, hooray. So class of 2021, turn on your sound. Everyone sound on. Are you ready? Hip, hip, hip hooray. hooray. Hip, 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 hooray. hooray. Hip, 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 hooray. hip, hip, hooray. And the long one, hip, 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 hip hooray. 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 Well done, everyone. Marvelous. Wonderful. And congratulations to everyone. And um, hopefully it all screened on, on, online and hopefully your family were able to do this. And we are so sorry about the fact that you are all having to find little spaces to do this in. But honestly, it's been a great year and it's been amazing to, to, to meet you all and to do everything. So raise your glasses and cheers, Good. school. Sante, whatever Thank language you. you have, use Yakida. it, and, Yakida. Yakida. <laughs> and here you go. And a yes, special, well done. And a special thanks to Malene for hosting this and for everything she's done for the students. There's incredible care that she's shown. So thank you, Malene. Yes. Thank you, everyone, and have a good have evening. And have a lovely do evening, everyone. Try and thank be students all. for a bit. Great to be part of this. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.